Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Cambridge Conversations webinar. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by about 1,350 people from the UK and around the world. So it's a very hot ticket and uh, a really key topic of conversation, I hope. So to introduce myself, I'm Roger Mosey. I'm the Master of Selwyn College. And uh, relevant in this case, I'm a former BBC journalist. I was editor of the Today programme and head of television news. And uh, now in Cambridge, I write sometimes for The New Statesman and The Spectator and The Independent and others about news and journalism, including, of course, misinformation, which is also one of the topics I covered in a book last year. And I'm delighted tonight to be joined by two wonderful panellists. So we have with us uh, Professor Sander van der Linden, who is Professor of Social Psychology in the Society and Director of the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab in the Department of Psychology. And his research looks at how people process misinformation and information, how it spreads in online networks, and how we can most effectively pre-bunk, we'll um, ask him about that word, and inoculate people against false information. Also joined by uh, Chris Morris, uh, Emmanuel, 1984, who is CEO at Full Fact, which is the UK's independent fact-checking organisation. And prior to this, he's a, another BBC renegade. He was the BBC's first dedicated fact-checker on air and online and pioneering fact-checking on mainstream outlets through his development and leadership of BBC Reality Check. And his work covered two general elections, post-Brexit politics, the US presidential election, the pandemic and the climate crisis. So uh, plenty to talk about there. Um, so let me, uh, first of all, Sandra, ask you a pretty simple question, I hope. Uh, what is misinformation? Yeah, you think that's a, a simple question, but it, it seems a lot of people, you know, don't agree on, on what counts as misinformation or, you know, what one person says is one person's fact is another person's misinformation, so to speak. And, you know, I think that gets at the heart of the of the problem. Um, so, you know, the way that that we define it in in the in the literature and we study this is most often we talk about information that is false or incorrect as determined by independent fact checkers or the best available scientific evidence or scientific consensus uh, at the time um, at which we're evaluating information. But I think that covers, you know, in my opinion, this covers a slice of misinformation that is mostly constrained to things that are fabricated and false. So for example, you know, BBC Verified does a great job at uh, pulling out manipulated images and showing people that in fact they're, you know, these, these were presented out of context. This actually comes from a video game, for example, during the Israel-Gaza conflict, you know, these are just video game images. This is obviously fake. This has been fact-checked as false, um, right? And so those are the cases that are pretty straightforward where that kind of definition works. But I think misleadingness should also be part of the definition of misinformation. And that's the definition that we operate, that's how we operationalize it in our research. And this is more, not something sort, sort of the sort of binary simplistic thinking about true false, but more about degrees of bias and misleadingness. So think about half truths and bias narratives. Uh, things that are presented out of context. So things that have some kernel of truth, but are framed in an otherwise misleading uh, way that leads people to form misperceptions uh, of, of reality. And I think that's a much bigger slice of the problem uh, and of the, the types of you know, misinformation that people come across in their daily lives. It's you know not, well, we do hear about reptilians and flat earth from time to time, uh, but I think you know the 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 sort of stuff that is that is not easily fact checked as entirely false, but is misleading in some ways is the more pernicious type of misinformation. Um, so I think misinformation is stuff that's either false or incorrect or misleading in some other way. But there has always been misinformation since the dawn of human civilization. So what why is it what is making it particularly acute now? Well, I think there's a few a few elements. I think you're completely right that there's always been propaganda and misinformation. I think you know one difference now is is how it spreads. And right, I um in my um uh, book, I actually went to the length of calculating how long it would take to spread a message in the Roman Empire. Uh, you know, some some falsehood. Uh, 
how it, how long it would take. And so, um, you know, if something travels via word of mouth, um, it, it could take days, if not weeks, to reach another person who would then have to spread it and, and so on. Um, so, of course, with the power of social media, it's it's obvious that we can now reach millions, if not billions of people within a matter of, of seconds. And it can have devastating consequences, too. You know, for example, the, the mob lynchings in India. So a message goes viral on WhatsApp. That's a rumor. Let's say that there's local kidnappers coming to your town. People get alarmed. They forward it to everyone they know. And mobs go out and try to look for people who fit this description. And, you know, it's totally false. They find someone and they lynch them. Um, and so this is a, this is a real problem uh, in the sense that, you know, it spreads faster than countermeasures can be put into place. Uh, and so that, I think, is is part of, of the issue that we're facing. So it spreads. We know that it spreads faster, deeper and further uh, than factual information, because the, the propagation of of information is different for false and reliable information. Reliable information tends to be complex, uh, not as shocking, not as exciting. It gets slowed down. So it doesn't travel as fast and as far than misinformation. It tends to be novel, emotional, shocking. Um, and so that, you know, that's that's different. But the mediums by which it reaches people is also completely different. Um, so now we're talking about, you know, group messaging platforms. Uh, we're talking about being targeted with information based on your online digital activity. So information that's tailored to you that may or may be false. Uh, that you don't even realize that it's it's being tailored to your specific interests and therefore has a greater capacity to to influence you, which is called micro targeting. Um, we even have nano targeting now, which is targeting messages at the level of a single individual. So it might be the case, right, that that different individuals see different versions of the same falsehood, and they don't even know. Uh, they think that everyone sees the same message, but actually it's targeted at such a level of specificity that different people could see different versions. We have generative AI, we have deep fakes. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot different about the way that misinformation reaches people today. And the psychology of that is also different from, from what it used to be, which was you confronted somebody in person and you try to, you know, ascertain uh, whether they're telling the truth. And then, of course, we came, after that, we had the print media. There we, we saw some escalation of... Uh, of falsehoods. I'm not sure if, if people are familiar with the Great Moon hoax, uh, which was a uh, you know when the uh, when you had the penny press, they they printed some a fake story uh, in the uh, I think it was the the journal of um, um, it, it it was a real journal, but it was discontinued. It was like the Royal Society for uh, um, I forget the actual name. I think it was uh, uh, meteorology or something like that. Um, um, or astrophysics, and it, it was a real journal, but it got discontinued, and they printed a story that um, this famous um, scientist had discovered uh, moon-dwelling bat humans, uh, um, um, you know, and uh, lots of lots of people believed it, uh, right, and they had a whole series that went on about the descriptions of these people, uh, and so lots of people were duped, and, 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 you know, then we had TV and radio, and, and now we have social media, so I think, you know, it, it sort of escalates um, across, you know, across human history in terms of how fast and how many people we can reach. And we haven't really kept up with the, with the scale of it. I think that's part of the problem. And Chris Morris, given the scale of what Sander just described, how on earth do you combat that with what's happening in just media and social media? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth leaning into what Sander says and reminding us ourselves that social media is media. And a lot of it um, is actually very well informed and quite groundbreaking. On the other hand, an awful lot of it is also opinion masquerading as fact, uh, rubbish um, strewn across our kind of online landscape and, of course, reams of misinformation. So I do think that social media has been a big wake up call for the traditional media. I mean, any big broadcast player, for example, uh, planning for the next UK election will be thinking almost as hard about what they're going to put out on TikTok as what they're going to put out on TV and radio, because they're all facing a young audience and they know what that young audience is watching and where it is, where it, where it is going online. But I suppose the net effect of the rise of social media and the sort of emergence of an everything, everywhere, all the time world is that there's been a massive loss of trust in traditional media. Uh, some of it, I think, has pro probably been lost forever, but not all of it. And to regain and retain trust, the media uh, needs to do a lot more to show it's working. 
uh, to exhibit what its sources are, why you should trust its information. And I guess this is where organizations like Full Fact and fact checking comes in. You've got to check facts. You've got to call it out when public figures get numbers or get, get bits of information wrong. Not if it's an opinion, but if it's misleading, a misleading statistic or something on which they are trying to base an opinion, but is wrong in the first place. So it's really important also to explain, to do a lot more, I think, than the media used to do, to explain context and to emphasize caveats. And you know, I think, thankfully, the days when big media companies used to sort of proclaim things as if they were passing down tablets of stone from the mountain, those days are gone. But it is the scale of the challenge which is uh, so huge. I think when the idea of fact-checking first emerged, maybe as a separate discipline, maybe 15, 20 years ago, I guess the question it was trying to answer uh, was, why is this guy lying to me? Or if you were, for those of a, who have a long UK memory, if you remember Jeremy Paxman, why is this expletive lying to me? But the question now is, can I believe anything I read or watch or hear anywhere? And I think we do need to take that challenge on, because if you have no shared notion of factual evidence, no basis of factual evidence on which to have political debate, then you have to start asking what is left of liberal democracy. And that, I think, is why it's so fundamental for all of us to make sure we get this right. But let, let me ask you some specifics, because it's not really quite as simple, is it, as saying this is true and this is false and combating perceived and agreed misinformation. So one example, in the very early days of the COVID pandemic, uh, a lot of people, including government health officials, said you didn't need to wear a mask. And the worry was that masks would somehow capture or intensify the virus. Then we went through a period in the middle where everybody had to wear a mask. And now I've certainly talked to medics who say that uh, against Omicron, wearing a blue mask was almost pointless. So the, the, the question of what is true on that shifted quite a bit. And at various times, you might have said, well, that's misinformation. And it actually turns out to be true in the end. Chris? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting example. I mean, I guess the, the first thing to say would be, you know, it was an extraordinary situation that everyone was dealing with. I mean, I remember talking to ICU docs at the time saying, it is as though we are medieval doctors with literally no textbooks to read because this this disease is so new. So it was it was a once in a century pandemic. I think it's also important to point out that you know science is based on uncertainty and it's based on testing evidence. And when the evidence changes, scientific advice can change. So I mean, I, I was obviously at the BBC at the time rather than at full fact. But I don't think we would have ever said, at least I hope we didn't, that wearing a mask is, is good for you is a fact. We would have reflected and reported on it as government advice. And then when the advice would change, we would try and interrogate that. So I, I, I think there is, you're right, I think that there is a, a, a sometimes a thin line between things changing as evidence changes and what becomes misinformation. But that comes down to, I think, about how you communicate. And I think there are probably lessons to be learned for governments uh, when they were faced with this extraordinary situation that no one alive really had ever experienced before. And perhaps some of the communication uh, was too definitive. Uh, so I think it, 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 I, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily count that as misinformation. It was probably well intentioned, but sometimes it probably created more problems than it solved. Sandra, um, someone has asked in the Q&A, Arnold has said, how serious is misinformation from, from traditional mainstream media as against social media? And I suppose that I would have grown up in an era in which you regarded what came from television and radio as true and what you heard down the village pub as maybe misinformation. But are those boundaries now becoming blurred because of social media? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And I think sometimes, um, you know, when we discuss social media, I think it's it's fair to say that, you know, people were exposed to misinformation and they were polarized even before we had social media, of course. Um, so to that extent, um, traditional media um, also has a problem. Um, I think the difference is, and, and coming back to sort of the point about what's new about social media, I think a huge difference that's important for people to keep in mind is that with social media, there is no barrier to entry. So I can create a YouTube video, I can create a TikTok video, I can post something. There are no editors. There are no fact checkers. 
there is no editorial process whatsoever that's going to ensure any amount of accuracy. Um, with traditional media, at least you have editors, at least you have fact checkers, at least there is a process by which people attempt to verify the information that they put out there, um, also because there are regulators um, who, who keep an eye out. And so that is a massive difference uh, between the online world and the traditional media world. Having said that, for example, if we if we look at the U.S. situation, you know, cable news is a huge source of misinformation uh, for people, especially during uh, elections. Uh, again, because you know the standards are more lax. So what you can say on cable news difference, what you can say on on other outlets. We, we're now getting more and more streaming news sites. Um, again, it attempts to circumvent editorial practice uh, rules and regulations. Because you know streaming is less regulated, um, and people are, are are trying to get around this by by starting their own new ch news channels uh, in these new media environments. Um, but that isn't to say that traditional media doesn't have a problem as well. So I, I think, for example, there's been tons of research on how cable news is a giant echo chamber. So you know the the U.S. landscape in particular is extremely divided. So you know people have CNN on all day have a very different view of the world than people who have Fox News on uh, uh, all day. Um, so it's a problem there because they don't have that many uh, uh, options, right? So people opt into a particular news media diet. I think in the UK, you know, there's certainly the critique that the traditional media are owned by a small group of, of individuals, which compromises the, the market. Uh, and that's also why the UK gets downgraded uh, by international organizations on freedom of the press. Uh, because a lot of people don't know often that a lot of the same outlets are owned by the same individuals um, and they control some of the same content that people see. So diversity of news media, or even in the traditional sense, is somewhat compromised. And you get, you know, as a result of that, you get similar polarization uh, in, uh, in, in, in the outlets. Um, and so it's different in other countries, like, for example, Sweden or, uh, or uh, the Netherlands or some some other countries that that have a, a slightly different uh, political and, and media landscape, um, they have problems too. But um, I think it's a general problem. But that is is kind of how I think about the distinction between traditional and um, and online media. And just That's Roger right. to come back full circle on the uh, on the great moon hoax, it occurred to me now that uh, Richard Locke, who was a descendant of John Locke, who 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 uh, perpetrated this, uh, was a Cambridge alumni. Um, and just uh, just just for the record. Okay, and Chris, um, one question in from Graham Pendlebury, and he says that he thinks misinformation is so ubiquitous that he now doesn't believe anything he sees on broadcast or social media, e.g. on Gaza, Israel, or the Ukraine war. Is he being too pessimistic, would you say? I'm not necessarily. I mean, I think a lot of people um, react in that way because technology means that the amount of information available to us is far more than any individual can handle. Um, it is literally overwhelming. Um, I think individuals, one of the things we knew it, need to do is, is make sure that, that media literacy and information literacy is not just only embedded in school, but is embedded in lifelong learning programs because people need to have the confidence of how they deal with information. I mean, I would argue that you can decide for yourself what your trusted news sources are and you do look at well how do they gather their information so for example when full fact when we do any fact check at full fact we will show all our sources where all our information that we have gathered evidence to put together has come from but i think because of that vast am amount of information and the complexity of it all and i know this is something that sanders written a lot about that's where conspiracy theories come from because conspiracy theories show you a way through the complexity. They join the dots, they make it suddenly seem simple and that's very attractive to some people. And they also kind of create this social network for you, this online family of like-minded believers. So when there is so much complexity, so much confusion, ironically, the conspiracy theory is almost offers more clarity than what most of us would think would be the reasonable and objective truth. And sometimes you get a sense that fact checking is something driven by political opponents. So the left want to fact check Trump and Johnson and the right want to fact check Jeremy Corbyn. But if you take something um, such as climate change, um, I like you both give answers on this. With climate change, there is clearly a body of scientific fact which we hope to surface and help, you know, 
convince people of an argument. But is it true that you can have disinformation on both sides? So you have climate change deniers on one side, but equally there are people who might exaggerate the effects of climate change and say that the world is about to burn when actually we're talking about, albeit concerning, uh, a relatively scientifically agreed progression of temperature rises. I mean, Sandra, is there a, a sort of middle ground there or how do you try to find it? You mean on um, on the the reporting on on climate change? Um, yes. In terms of, well, I, I I just wonder. You know, we we talk a lot about fact checking people who are climate deniers, but equally yeah, yeah. we fact check people who might be climate alarmists to the opposite political point of view. Yeah, yeah. There was um, there was a very interesting case. Uh, so Extinction Rebellion is is one of the sort of more radical activist groups who. Who, um, they had a, a PR person who, uh, who, this is a famous segment now, um, who was on a, a talk show in the UK. And um, he, kept, he kept asking about their message that millions of people are going to die uh, in, in the very sort of near future. And so the IPCC doesn't say anything about that in their report. And they kept sort of asking and asking. And then at the end, this unfortunate spokesperson had to say, well, we, we, you know, we, made a, we might have made up some facts there. Um, and, and, you know, I think the, the idea is that it's somehow psychologically for people, it's about the gist. So climate change is dangerous. It's endangering the planet. And so it's it's OK to sort of, you know, get the number. Is it a few million? Is it now? Is it 100 years from now? It's OK to sort of, you know, be a little off because the gist is true. Um, and I think that's actually how it works with a lot of misinformation uh, on the other side of the spectrum, too. Like some people don't actually believe, for example, in the US that the election was fraudulent or that um, the royal family are shape-shifting lizards. Um, but the the idea, there is a gist there that the royal family can't be trusted or that the government is doing fraudulent things. And so the idea is that the gist of it uh, is is true and that leads people to um, to endorse some of, um, some of these uh, narratives. But if we're talking about fact-checking, um, yeah, I think it, it it works both ways, right? And so if people spread misinformation about climate change, you know, stuff that is technically incorrect, for example, if I tell everyone now that everyone's going to die tomorrow because of climate change, that's uh, that's clearly not true. Um, and so even though I might do it because I'm encouraging people to act on climate change, uh, technically that's, that's misinformation. Um, and um, I think it would behoove people to, to call it out more because otherwise you do create this perception that the fact checking process and that the people you know in power at universities are only going after uh, a particular kind of misinformation and i think that can sometimes damage you know public trust in these institutions i think the reason the practical reason why i don't see much impetus for misinformation about covid or climate is because of this gist notion so okay the mask thing whatever Right. It's basic physics. Wearing a mask is better than not wearing a mask. Filtration is better than no filtration. Um, so it's, you know, ultimately, this is a good thing, regardless of whether we get the specific facts right uh, or not. And so, you know, climate change is going to be bad. And so we want people to to act. And so I think there's this general notion that exaggerating the truth a little isn't as bad as exaggerating a falsehood. Um, and that is a kind of a, an asymmetry that is tough to think about because, you know, there is something to the idea that perhaps is less concerning if people exaggerate the truth than if we make up a falsehood and start spreading and exaggerating that because the consequences are probably somewhat, somewhat different. Like what is the cost of people being too cautious about COVID or taking too much action on climate change because of misinformation versus what is the cost of people, you know, storming a Capitol building or intentionally spreading a virus. Uh, and so that I think people, have difficulty grappling with the asymmetric consequences. Uh, and and um, I think in practice, fact checkers and others spend different amounts of time on these uh, elements. And maybe Chris can, can jump in because he might know more about that. Um, but I think it would be good to, to make sure people don't get the impression that the fact checking process is biased by only selecting certain types of of claims, and I think it's tough because they're limited resources. So you have to think about what's most consequential. That's that's how I envision it. But maybe Chris has additional additional thoughts. Anyone else, Chris? Yeah. Um, 
both in the BBC and now with Full Fact, did you find initially that it was people wanting to call out Donald Trump and Boris Johnson? And actually, if you look at Full Fact, of course, you also call out uh, Rachel Reeves and a whole bunch of Labour politicians do. But was that a political move at times in the fact checking systems? So I, I think there's been a, there's a bit of a split in in the world of fact checking. I would say I think fact checking in the United States has become more partisan, and I think it's partly because politics in the United States has become so partisan. Um, in the UK, certainly at Full Fact, and I would say across a lot of Europe, it's treated slightly differently. We're a charity, for example, so impartiality is embedded in our charitable objectives, just as it was in my previous job at the BBC. So. Yeah, I mean, we have a we we fact check people from all across the political spectrum, and I think our starting point would be we want more political debate, not less. We don't want to shut anybody down. It's just that we would argue that to have genuinely useful political debate, it needs to be based on reliable evidence which stands up to statistical scrutiny. Now, was there a particular emphasis on Donald Trump and, and Boris Johnson at the time? Well, they were president and prime minister, respectively, of, of two of the most powerful countries in the world. So so yes, and I think whatever you think of either of them politically, uh, they both had a fairly strained relationship with the truth. I don't. I mean, the, you don't have to take my word for it. The House of Commons itself concluded that Boris Johnson probably had a more distant relationship with the truth than any prime minister in our lifetimes. And it's interesting if you look at Mr. Trump and Mr. Johnson, I think they're very different political figures. But what they both have real political talent at doing is telling stories. And I think that comes back to the, to the point we were making earlier about how important narratives are. You can pick out individual facts and you can say you got this fact wrong or that fact wrong. But the people who care about the facts still need to tell better stories than the people who don't. Because stories is how we learn. It's been embedded in our DNA for generations. And, you know, you've worked in the newsroom, Roger, and I can assure anyone listening that honestly, quite often people do stand up in a newsroom and shout across the newsroom. That's a brilliant story. They very rarely shout, that's a fabulous fact. So stories and how you tell stories and the ability to tell stories is really, really important. Um, we're about halfway through with uh, uh, Sandra and Chris and lots of questions coming in. So we'll go to those in a bit more detail in a moment or two. But um, <laughs> Sandra, when I did the introduction, I said you use this um, phrase, how to pre-bunk. Um, and a lot of your research is in that area. Can you just explain that? Um, as 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 succinctly as you can to us. <clears throat> yeah. So pre-bunking is is all about being preemptive, uh, and uh, it's a proactive strategy to try to counter misinformation. So so rather than debunking or fact checking after the fact, which is still you know very important, uh, we try to build preemptive resilience so that people don't get duped uh, in in the first place. And we do that through this idea of of inoculation. And so inoculation actually follows the vaccination. Uh, analogy pretty exactly. So just as you introduce a weakened or inactivated strain of a virus into the body to try to trigger the production of antibodies to help confer resistance against future infection, it turns out you can actually do the same with the brain. So if you give people a weakened dose of a falsehood or the techniques used to produce falsehoods, and you refute and deconstruct it in advance for people, why it's misleading or what the issue is, people can build up cognitive or mental immunity resistance uh, over time so that when they're actually exposed to the full dose of misinformation later on, um, they become more resistant to it. And to give you a practical example of, of actually how that works, you know, Twitter implemented this idea before this was before Musk. Um, but, um, you know, they would send a, a, a prompt to the top of everyone's feed in the US and they say, hey, you might be seeing some misinformation about the upcoming election on Twitter. We want you to be aware of that. But also, and this is the that's the warning, and here's the the prebunk, is um you know you might come across some um, um, rumors that voting electronically is is unsafe and that it increases election fraud. However, you should know that all the election experts have concluded that it's safe and secure to vote by mail. And here are some authoritative authoritative sources that you can use to uh, to further investigate this. So that by the time social media becomes flooded with misinformation about how voting by mail isn't isn't safe. Um, people had been 
uh, inoculated um, and and could resist it more. Um, and um, yeah, so that's what we um, uh, if we have time. I can give another example um, um, about politicians. One of my favorite ones is uh, the false dilemma, which is hugely prevalent right now. So in a lot of our research, we don't try to tell people what to believe. Is this true? Yes or no. But we want to help people identify manipulations and empower people to make up their own minds. Um, so a false dilemma is when you present people with two options, right? Well, in fact, there's many more. And the idea is to take away all nuance uh, and get people into more extremist modes of thinking. Uh, so an example would be if you're, if you're, a current example would be if you're pro-Israel, you're anti-Palestine. That's a false uh, dilemma, but people love to use it in, in online discourse and it, it leads to misperceptions, right? Or um, it, we need to do something about the uh, immigration uh or, you know, we, we need to fix the NHS before we can think about immigration. Sure, resources are limited, but that's a false dilemma. Um, so how do you inoculate people? We show people a video from Star Wars. I don't know if we have any Star Wars fans, but Revenge of the Sith, where you have Anakin Skywalker, who goes on to become Darth Vader, spoiler alert. Um, and he says to Obi-Wan Kenobi, if you're not with me, then you're my enemy. And then Obi-Wan says, you know, only a Sith deals in absolutes and then a narrator goes and says look nobody wants to be a sith right don't use these manipulation techniques here's how you can find them online and we do that you know in the app spaces on youtube you know those annoying ads that you can't skip um so that people are armed with the ability to pre-bunk false dilemmas when they watch videos of politicians and others using them and that's how it works Hey, uh, Chris Webley asked a question, which I think uh, comes at this from a slightly different angle, but in the same area. He says, how much extra psychological weight do we give to the first messages we hear and see? Uh, so in that case, is truth always playing catch up against early misinformation? Well, I can answer that quickly and maybe Chris has something to add. But just sure. Yeah. From a psychological standpoint, there's the. Uh... Uh, primacy effect, which is uh, basically the the first and the last thing that you hear, you're more likely to remember. So yeah, if you if you hear if you process a falsehood first, it actually integrates itself in in your memory, which is a big, which acts like a social network really. So it gets everywhere. Uh, and then the problem is if you're trying to undo that, you you can undo a few links, but not all of them. And so it kind of stays and lingers and reproduces itself. Um, and so that's a that's a that's a big problem. So it's better to try to prevent people from hearing a falsehood first. And so when you think about the inoculation metaphor, it's ideal when it's prophylactic, when you come totally before as a preventative uh, effort. It still works a little bit when people are already exposed, but not yet fully enthralled by it. It's more of a therapeutic kind of sense. But you know, when, once people are already down the rabbit hole, once they've been exposed repeatedly to misinformation, then it's going to be less effective. So yes, there's a lot of value, uh, you know, um, uh, an okay. ounce of prevention and, and from a from a practical i mean that, that's the kind of psycho psychology perspective roger from a practical perspective from my previous career as a journalist you know people get audiences get very angry when you don't do instant fact checks during you know like a live leaders debate in um you know during an election or a, a question time politicians talking the, the trouble is it's really difficult to do a fact check one second after somebody has said something it's out there and even if it takes you 20 seconds to come up with actually we've just checked that that's wrong um and 20 seconds later the conversation has already moved on and so it's very it is very difficult to react with the speed that people can talk we do have tools that help us with that now I and mean, there's a lot of talk and i've seen some of the questions coming in about generative ai uh, and I think, you know, a lot of fears have been expressed every time you open a newspaper that generative AI is simply going to sort of add warp speed to the, to the fears we have about misinformation. But every time there is a transformative technology emerging, it can also have enor it can almost, also be an enormous power for good. And so we've developed a uh, an automated fact checking software, which is starting to be right. We certainly use it in the UK. Uh, and we are starting to use it, um, fact-checking groups across Africa, in the Middle East, are starting to use it. And it effectively takes the millions and millions of words that are spoken, for example, in election campaign, and uses a large language model to look for uh, the kind of pattern of language in which claims are made. It looks for repeat uh, forms of language. It can instantly, in real time, then check that against a whole body of uh, of factual of, of fact checks that have been done in the past, 
and of what, what um, are re reputable sources of information. And it is as close as we can currently get to live fact checking. It's not literally instant the same second, but it's getting closer and closer to that. And it also allows, you know, a, a machine can go through millions of words in a way that human beings simply can't. And the machine, the AI, can then tell the human beings who can add context and caveats, these are the several thousand words that you need to concentrate on to be able to do a good job for audiences and give, if it's an election, give voters the information they deserve, the good information on which they can then make their choices. Okay, so I Chris, think there are some good things to be coming out of the AI revolution as well as, as, as threatening ones. Chris, related to what you just said, um, Helen's iPhone, which I assume has Helen somewhere on it, um, says what mechanisms, are in, what mechanisms are in place to call out and sanction those in positions of power, such as politicians who spout or spread misinformation. Somebody else had asked earlier whether it should actually be made illegal to lie if you're a politician. Can you go that far, Chris? It's, it's interesting. So there was actually, um, as you know, in the UK, if you get 100,000 signatures on a petition, then it has to be deb debated by MPs in, in, in the House of Commons. And there was a petition that was debated about should lying in the House of Commons be a criminal offence? Um, it wasn't introduced by the government as a piece of legislation, so it's not going to become law. But there are things that, that you can do. For example, we uh, successfully via a procedure committee um, inquiry uh, have changed the rules of the House of Commons. This is something that Full Fact has been campaigning on for a couple of years, so that MPs can now correct the official record. In other words, Hansard, where where there is the official record of debates in the House of Commons. Until now, only ministers were able to correct the official record. So even if an MP was informed that they'd something said something that was incorrect, all they could do was maybe stand up a couple of weeks later and say, point of order, Mr Speaker, what I said two weeks ago was not correct. But the incorrect information would stay on the official record, which would then be scraped by generative AI or by Google, and so the misinformation would spread. But what we've managed to do, uh, and I'm pleased to say that MPs have agreed that this is going to be a change in the rules, which will come in shortly, is that every MP will now be able to correct the official record so that in Hansard, in that official written record of, of, of everything which is, on, uh, which is said in the House of Commons, if somebody says, I've made a mistake, when you go to that piece of information in the speech that is made, it will have the the correction there and the explanation of the connection of the connection right of the correction right next to it. So I think there are ways in which you can improve and limit the spread of bad information. Uh, but can you sanction politicians for lying? The trouble is, it's up to the politicians to change the laws, and we're the people who vote for them. So I'm a great believer in in the fact that people get the politicians they deserve, and if we want to change the laws then we have to vote for people who want to change the laws in that way. Sandra, um, a question which goes to the heart of your psychology specialism from Roger Lasco. Are particular personality types more or less susceptible to conspiracy theories? <clears throat> um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as saying specific personality types in, in the way that we, you know, quiz people on their personality. So, you know, there, there has been some debate about conscientiousness, um, for example, or neuroticism. Um, but those results um, aren't really that uh, that stable, I would say. I think what's much more evident is that there is a profile of people who are more likely to believe and spread misinformation. Those people tend to be those who are more politically extreme in general. It could be on the left or the right. Sometimes there is an asymmetry, but generally people who are more politically extreme people who spend a lot of time on social media, uh, people who are low in trust, trust in government, trust in media, trust in official organizations, people who score high on paranoia, um, interpersonal paranoia, paranoia about politics, um, people who are generally lower education, lower numeracy and analytical thinking skills. Um, and depending on the topics, it can vary, you know, in the West, males are more likely to believe conspiracy theories than females. That's not true necessarily globally, but it is true in a lot of Western countries. Um, sometimes older people uh, are more likely to spread misinformation among certain political uh, topics, but then younger people are more susceptible uh, in other domains. So there's a lot of variation, but the profile is generally uh, of, of people who are low in, in trust, spend a lot of time on social media and are politically extreme. 
Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left if you want to get questions in. There are, are some great questions coming in, which is why I'm um, um, zooming in on, on those. Um, I, I guess a quick fire one from Adrian Gamble for both of you. Um, in the context of the discussion we've been having, uh, where do you go to get your news? So where do you go, Chris? Where do you go, Sandra, for your news that doesn't have misinformation? Chris? Oh, goodness. I mean, I suppose, um, you know, I worked for the BBC for a long time and I know a lot of people who still work there. So I still do do read and consume it. But I also make sure I think it's really important not to stay in an echo chamber. So I so in terms of British newspapers, I will deliberately read newspapers that are on the left and on the right, because I don't want to just read things that I might agree with. I want to be challenged by by other things. And I also want to see where um, I, I think in the new in newspapers, there needs to be more of what I suggested um, broadcasters are beginning to do, which is just being much more explicit if they're making a claim about where the source of the information comes from. I mean, a question we're often asked is who fact checks the fact checkers? And the answer is, well, everybody does, because whenever we write a fact check, we will put in a link to the source of the information, whether it's the Office for National Statistics or whatever. But I think the more transparency that's there, the better. So I just try and as a personal opinion, just try and reach get get a broader spectrum of information as possible from across different political opinions, and that allows me to make up my own mind. Sander, yeah, I would second that. I think making sure that you're not stuck in an echo chamber is is very important. But I, I would go further, and I would say stay away from social media. So there there's another there's another question that um, was about how many people are getting the news from social media. I mean, it depends on the poll and the age group. Uh, uh, it's more amongst younger people than older people, but about 50% of the population regularly gets their uh, news from social media, which is uh, problematic because we know that the quality of news reporting on social media is low. Um, and I'm on social media. I, I, I do check it. I mean, I see lots of news on social media, but I remind myself that actually... Um, this is a low quality source. Um, and, and so I don't engage with it uh, too much. What I like to do is I like to Google the um, both the accuracy and the bias of an outlet. So if you go to places like uh, NewsGuard or Media Bias Fact Check, they have most outlets and they'll tell you what the factual accuracy is of an outlet as well as their bias or their leaning. So let's say you put in The Economist, it'll say, you know, slightly right of center, but very high accuracy. Um, and they also tell you the reasons uh, why. Um, and so I try to keep that in mind when I read news stories. Like, okay, I know this is a, a credible outlet, but I also know that they're leaning a bit to the left or the right. Um, and then I, I tend to look at different uh, outlets and not just within the UK, but also internationally if it's if it's big news, right? Um, I, I tend to triangulate uh, different sources to see what the consistency is. And I think the unfortunate thing is that, you know, most people don't have the time or, or energy uh, to go through through that much effort to, to read the news. So as a, as a shorthand heuristic, I would say avoid um, avoid uh, social media. And I would second uh, Chris's suggestion to make sure that your media diet is uh, is, is sufficiently uh, diverse. Um, and unfortunately, ask, yeah, go I ahead. Say, can I ask a question? Which um, two questions, but put them to both of you because they're in a very similar territory. So Colleen McLaughlin. How might we best prepare young people for this current context? What's counterproductive and what are the implications for education? And then Rebecca Stratton, who says she's a secondary school teacher and is interested in equipping my students to deal with the world. Do you have any advice on how best to equip young people to be misinformation savvy? Um, Sandra first. And then Chris. Yeah, so we do we do a lot of work in, in that context in educational settings. And so, you know, we, we advocate for this pre-bunking approach specifically because you know it's much more or the, the logic is that if you do this from an early age and make it mandatory in national educational curricula uh, at every level uh, uh, in terms of media literacy skills then by the time we become adults we're going to be much more resilient uh, to, to misinformation I mean that's of course the, the hope so you know we've created games uh, one of our games called bad news another uh, is called go viral which was about the pandemic these are free they're they're, um, they're kind of edgy um, in that um, what we found in our work is that a lot of students think that science has a yawn factor. A lot of people don't like being told what the facts are, what they need to believe. 
So we, we create social media simulations that allow people uh, to walk a mile in the shoes of a propagandist uh, and see what tricks they use to do people online. So people find it kind of funny to, to step into the shoes of a bad guy um, and find out from the inside what tricks they use so that they can recognize them themselves uh, when it when it actually happens. Uh, we also have videos, kind of animated videos, where we use material from South Park or The Simpsons or uh, Star Wars uh, to try to engage youth um, with um, with these topics, because we know that they don't respond very well to the you know the kind of like check your sources, open another tab when you're googling, um, and so you know even though that that's important, um, it it doesn't speak to them at the level at which they're engaging on social media with videos, with animation, AI. So we try to build innovative tools and then make them available to to educators, um, and it's all free and, and publicly uh, available. Okay. Yeah, I, I I back up most of that, Roger. I mean, you know, follow the example of a country like Finland, which has media and information literacy embedded in edu in its education system. You know, from the very youngest age, uh, we could do a lot more. I think of that in the UK, and and absolutely, I agree with with Sandra in terms of advice for school teachers. Make sure you talk to the pupils in the language they understand. We live in an increasingly visual culture. That's how people get their information. I mean, my son's just done his A-levels and I was forever saying to him, shouldn't you be reading more books? And he said, no, I'm, I'm looking at this video on YouTube. It's really good. And I'd sit down occasionally and watch them and they were really good. And that's the good, that's the good news about, you know, the social media. There is some good stuff out there. It's just, you've got to curate it and you've got to, you've got to give young people the confidence to know the difference between the good stuff and the bad stuff. And that, that does come down to a good education system, uh, which, which enables them to, to, to reach the, the good stuff, which is definitely out there. Um, Chris, you've been um, talking about the nobility, as I would um, sometimes agree, of the conventional media. Jenny Kartopoulos and a few other people have asked if you can have misinformation by omission. So recently, she says, the BBC featured a march of 200 people in London, but not a march of 20,000 people in London on the same day. So uh, th this question about um, you can never have all the facts there, can you? So we are talking about only a certain set of selected facts that are in contention and discussed. I mean, I suppose you, you you can make an argument to call it misinformation by omission. I suppose the other way you would look at it is editorial priorities. I mean, you yourself know that the 10 o'clock news at the end of the day, once you've taken out the headlines and the weather, is about 22 minutes to tell the story of what's happened in the world today. So inevitably, it misses out an awful lot of things. And whether you agree with them or not, there are people who are there all day thinking about what are the most important things we believe we should tell anyone watching about what has happened today. Now, of course, there's always going to be a thousand different opinions about what should be the first story on the news, what should be the last story on the news, what shouldn't be on the news. Um, I would prefer that it's done by people who are thinking about it all day. It doesn't mean I, I don't watch the news every day and think, yep, they've got that just right. Of course, it's a lot of it is very subjective. But within that, I think the people I know who work there are trying their hardest to make sure uh, to the best of their ability that they're giving a fair account of, of what has happened. Are there times when they get it wrong? Absolutely. And I, are there times when I got it wrong? Absolutely. Senda, um, uh, V. Roberts and other people too have just asked the question about why we're only using the term misinformation rather than distinguishing it from disinformation. Yeah, well, my answer to that is that, you know, disinformation is misinformation coupled with some psychological intention to explicitly deceive or, or harm people, right? So disinformation is generally understood as a as a as an intentional targeted attempt to mislead people with with misinformation. The problem is that this is difficult to prove from a legal perspective. So you have to prove intent uh, and that's a differentiator. And that can be quite difficult because often, you know, a politician might, you know, s smear another candidate with misinformation and then afterwards say, oh, it was a joke. It was satire, um, right? And so how do you, how do you prove that uh, it, was, it was intentional? Um, there are cases. So for example, the tobacco industry, there was a US uh, federal court ruling um, that the tobacco industry had manipulated public opinion for the last 50 years with false information about the link between smoking and disease. And they have documentation showing that they intentionally did this. And so that's disinformation. The fossil fuel industry 
has similar documentation showing that they actively uh, tried to mislead the public on the link between emissions uh, and climate change. Um, um, fraud in the pharmaceutical industry, right? There are there are examples of this information where there's legal documentation, and then I think we can confidently speak about this. Um, but when we don't, I, I tend to err on the side of caution and say that something is misinformation without having full knowledge about whether it was intentional. So propaganda is generally understood as disinformation in the surface of a political agenda, and that it's often done intentionally, you know, whether we talk about Russian, pro you know, or, or government propaganda or any type of propaganda. Um, and, you know, usually there's some good basis there for assuming it's intentional. But, you know, if you want to be if you want to be uh, erring on the side of caution, misinformation is, is safer, I think. Yeah, I mean, in, intent is the, is the crucial word, Roger. I mean, you know, you can, you can have examples where your uncle or your auntie might put something in the family WhatsApp app group with the best of intentions, but it's actually wrong and it misinforms you on something which could be, you know, quite important on a, you know, a health issue or something. That's misinformation. But if you can prove deliberate intent to deceive for political ends, I would call that disinformation. OK, we've only got five or six minutes left, so we'll try and get as many questions in as many answers. Um, Sander, Phil Jones has responded to what you said about pre-bunking by asking, is there in any inherent barrier to those peddling misinformation that they can put an idea out well in advance of it being ubiquitous? And that leads to uncritical acceptance of their view by virtue of having it been inculcated before time. Yeah, so unfortunately, I think, you know, with any tool, People can use it for, uh, you know, in ways that are either in the public interest or not. So, you know, it is theoretically possible for somebody to hijack this concept and, and use it for, you know, uh, for, for sinister purposes. Um, but that's why I think, and you can trace pre-bunking all the way back to, uh, uh, to, to Aristotle. Uh, and he, he talked about, you know, preempting snake oil salesmen uh, and, and uh, you know, revealing their logical fallacies. Um, but but that actually gets me to the point that if you integrate this into early education, then you're always going to be the first. Uh, and that's why I think, yes, in some way, this will be an information war where people will, could try to pre-bunk you and it gets meta, you know, you, you can try to inoculate against an inoculation. But if you, if you want to get around that, you have to start at the beginning and start pre-bunking from, uh, from an early age. OK, um, a couple of people have also asked about um, AI, and obviously, Chris, you talked about that, um, um, the extent to which AI can be both, I guess, good and bad, because uh, we know that AI is going to have biases as well as human factors. So, Sander, is AI some of the solution to this or, or are you equally concerned about that? Well, I, I'm concerned about it for the, some of the reasons that we've discussed. I mean, there's currently very little regulation about how, you know, how deepfakes can be used in political campaigns. I mean, politicians in the U.S. are using it as part of their uh, political campaigns, uh, and there's uh, there's no clear regulation. Uh, social media platforms are not taking down deepfakes posted by politicians. Um, uh, they have, you know, they're they're because the, the regulation is lacking, um, and so that is deeply uh, concerning. I, I think you know once people are no longer able to distinguish what's real from from what's manipulated in a very realistic way. That's all very concerning. But I also see the benefits of AI, like Chris was saying, automated fact checking, automated debunking. You can automate pre-bunks too, because a lot of the narratives that are used to mislead people are repeated throughout history. Um, and uh, you know, Chat GPT, for example, uh, can can anticipate uh, some of these techniques uh, really, really well. And actually, we've used AI before it was you know popular. Um, to actually generate a uh, test for us, which we call the misinformation susceptibility test. It's open source. You know, anyone can take it. It gives you uh, an indication of how susceptible you are as an individual. It's kind of a quiz you can take. It was created by an AI. Um, and so I definitely think that there are opportunities for AI to assist in the, in, in countering misinformation um, as much as just it is to yeah. Chris, just to add into that question, just in from Mike Flood, who says, why can't large language models be trained on databases of good quality information, e.g. articles from The Economist, Reuters, BBC, Wikipedia, etc.? Well, they, they can. I mean, obviously, you can have a debate about what you think the um, sources of good information are. Uh, but that absolutely can happen. And I think it, it will happen. It's, I think the, the problem is, 
as Sandra has just said, AI is going to be an accelerator for both good and bad information. And there's going to be a bit of an arms race, frankly, about, about who wins that. I think next year is going to be a very big year because there are elections in the UK, in the United States, uh, many big elections all around the world. And I guess there's always a first election, right? There would have been the first smartphone election, the first Twitter election. But I think the first AI, AI election is probably going to be qualitatively different in a way that we haven't maybe seen since the first television election. Older, older viewers may remember you know, Kennedy and Nixon and the kind of the transformative nature of that, that election debate that was seen by people rather than listened to by, to, to, to by many people for the first time. And so I think you know, we've seen just in the UK in the last couple of weeks fake audio, audio emerging of Keir Starmer and of the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. I suspect we're going to have to prepare for a veritable tsunami of similar things from all sides of the political spectrum and political parties, journalists, the media, and probably the government as well, government agencies are going to have to have plans in place about how to deal with those. Now, I think it's going to be a big challenge throughout the, throughout the course of next year in the UK and other elections right around the world. OK, we're, we're coming um, close to the end of our time, but I know lots of people, judging by the number of questions and number of people on the call, uh, will want to know more. So I'm going to give you a chance of a 30 second commercial each to tell us where you can find out more about your research and your work. So, um, Sander, give us your your pitch. Where is it? I'll give, yeah, I'll give two ideas. One is, uh, you know, I have a, a, a new book out called Foolproof, uh, Why We Fall for Information and How to Build Immunity. Um, if people want to read more about the psychology and the sort of, you know, why our brains are susceptible and practical solutions and what we can do about it, uh, it's all there. If people want, if educators want uh, specific tools, inoculation.science is the website where you can find a lot of the, the practical info. And Chris? Well, I mean, as an advert for my own organization, you can go to fullfact.org to see the sorts of things we fact check. And I've seen a couple of questions uh, come in about um, left wing bias. We fact check people right across um, the political spectrum. And if there were to be a Labour government at the next election, we will be fact checking them just as vigorously as we fact, fact check the Conservative government in the last few years. But most of all, I just urge people to be curious and, and to, to occasionally just take a pause for thought thinking, is this really a real image? Do I really believe what this person has said on social media? And before sharing stuff, just occasionally sort of pause for a second and think, is this actually believable? Am I actually spread doing something which is, am I spreading bad information or is this good information that people can trust? Okay, um, my 10 second commercial is I'm on Twitter at Roger Mosey and I wrote a book last year called 20 Things That Would Make the News Better. And um, all it remains for me to do is to thank Sander and Chris for what I certainly found a, a fascinating and uh, wonderful conversation tonight. A huge number of questions, a uh, hundred questions already uh, unanswered, I'm afraid. So apologies if we didn't get to yours, but we try to get to as many and as representative a set of questions as possible. Uh, so all I'll do now is say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, wherever you are in the world, stay safe and good night from us. Good night.